Hello and welcome to Research Matters Podcasts. Today I, Aishwarya Vishwamitra, will give you a summary of science stories that were published during the week on Research Matters. In your weekly dose of Indian science news, today, I cover stories on astrophysics, ecology and health. Last week, we talked about heat waves and India having its first forecast system that can predict heat waves a couple of weeks in advance. This week, let's go to the source of heat in the solar system, the sun. A new study by an international team of scientists from China, the USA, the UK, Hungary, Austria, Germany and India have uncovered what heats up the sun's corona, which is the outermost part of the solar atmosphere. Just like how volcanoes spit out fiery hot lava from the Earth's center, the sun spits out jets of plasma at speeds twice that of rockets we used to travel to space. These jets are called spicules and last for a few minutes. However, unlike volcanoes, these spicules are so common that at any given time, about 1% of the sun's surface is covered by them. In this study, the researchers studied the spicules on the sun using the Good Solar Telescope (GST) at the Big Bear Solar Observatory in the USA to find their source. They found that the magnetic fields generated by fast-moving charged particles are the source of these plasma jets. As the solar atmosphere is constantly active, these particles swirl around and the magnetic fields get twisted and tangled. When enough amounts of energy in the magnetic field are converted to the kinetic energy of the particles, volcano-like spicules are formed. That's some literal hot science news, isn't it? Back on Earth, scientists from the Indian Institute of Science Bengaluru have tried a way to kill two birds with one stone. Relax. I'm talking about treating malaria and tuberculosis, two dreaded diseases in the tropics with chloroquine, a well-known anti-malarial drug. Unlike malaria though, treating tuberculosis is not that simple, and the patient needs to take antibiotics for over 6 to 9 months to prevent a relapse. Sometimes patients discontinue their medication before this period is up because it's so long. But that helps Mycobacterium tuberculosis, the bacteria that causes TB, to become resistant to these drugs. The alarming rise of drug resistant tuberculosis is an immense health concern world over. When infections strike our body, cells in our immune system called macrophages detect the invading pathogens and kill them by releasing oxidants. But drug resistant tuberculosis bacteria are super smart. They release antioxidants and thus get away from being killed by the cells. Researchers at IIC took a closer look at this mechanism to beat the bacteria at their own game. They found that these drug tolerant bacteria choose to occupy the most acidic macrophages. and use the low pH as a signal to produce antioxidants and thus cause infection. That's when the researchers realized that chloroquine, an anti-malarial drug, could possibly help because it reduces acidification in immune cells. When they tested it along with the commonly used anti-TB drugs, they found a 5-time increase in bacterial death. In fact, after 8 weeks of treatment, the lungs of TB infected mice were free of tuberculosis bacteria. Compare that to the 6 to 9 month procedure before. The researchers now plan on testing these drug combinations with chloroquine on humans, giving hopes of curtailing drug resistant tuberculosis infections. Many adventures in science are accidental. Penicillin came to be the world's first antibiotic drug. when Alexander Fleming discovered some of his bacteria dead due to the fungus after he returned from a vacation. If you are enjoying this podcast with a bowl of popped corn, that too was an accidental discovery. Percy Spencer, an engineer, was testing a new vacuum tube when he noticed that a chocolate bar in his pocket melted more quickly than expected. He started experimenting by aiming the tube at corn and voila, popcorn. After all, being curious and observant has its own perks, right? Well, that's what Vignesh Kamath, a field ecologist, did in 2016. He was at Kalakkad Mundanthurai Tiger Reserve in Tamil Nadu, studying frogs. One day, he accidentally noticed a partially eaten carcass of a Nilgiri langur in the forest. Curious to know which animal may have killed it, he set up a camera trap. One particular visitor to the carcass captured his attention, the brown mongoose. 
The Indian brown mongoose is a nocturnal, elusive inhabitant of the Western Ghats. Since they are hard to spot, very little information is known on their ecology, behavior, and the threats they face. Determined to know more about the lives of this mongoose, Mr. Kamath, along with Dr. Sheshadri K.S., a researcher at the Madras Crocodile Bank Trust and Center for Herpetology, started observing their foraging behavior. In the first observation, they found four behavioral aspects during the scavenging of the langur carcass. Feeding, vigilance, walking, and grooming. On a second occasion, they saw a pair of brown mongooses that had dug and scraped into the mud, probably searching for invertebrates in the area. In yet another encounter, a solitary brown mongoose was found feeding in one of the household garbage dump. The study is the first of its kind to provide any details into the behavioral aspects of these mongoose, a rare and least explored animal in the Western Ghats. Now let's shift gears from ecology to engineering. If you have ever tried understanding how a gun works, you may have noticed that every time a bullet is fired, it scrapes away a bit of the material from inside the gun's barrel. Over time, the size of the barrel increases, leading to missed targets and the need for frequent maintenance. Chromium-6, a readily available and easy to use metal, was hence used to coat the inside of the barrel. However, it is a cancer-causing material, and considering guns are widely used by our troops, we needed a safer alternative. In a recent study, researchers from the Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur, have explored the use of a new blend of Chromium-3 instead of 6. Chromium-3 is an environment-friendly and safer alternative, and they wanted to use that as a coating material. However, a drawback of Chromium-3 is that the coating becomes very thin and is still susceptible to wear. The researchers hence used carbon nanotubes to make it more resistant to wear and something called Yttria stabilized zirconia to give it strength. This allowed them to obtain better coatings at low thickness. The researchers plan to extend this solution from guns to hydraulic cylinders and rods, pistons for internal combustion engines and cutting tools. Thank you for listening to this episode of Research Matters Podcast. We will be back next weekend with some more exciting science news. For more such podcasts and news, please log on to www.researchmatters.in.